Welcome, your tens. Right, okay, so this is a bit weird. This is me teaching you from home. And this is you either sat in a classroom watching this in a big screen, or you're sat watching this like on your laptops in your houses or wherever you are. Either way, we've got an important poem to cover and it's checking out my history. I'm doing this one now because I know that I've got loads of them printed at the back of the classroom and there are plenty of spare ones. So if you need to pause this video, to go and get them and make sure everybody has a copy. They look like this on the B side, they look like that on the A side. Then do pause it now and make sure everybody's got one. So I'm giving you a chance to press pause, but okay. Done that? Good. Right, so um, as usual, we'll begin this poem by looking at context. You can look at it at home. Um, you can look at it on OneNote and all this stuff is obviously available there on my rubbishy TV. I'll try and go through it with you, some of this context, and I'll explain some things to you. So the first thing is, once you're on OneNote, um, to be clear, you need to go to the content library, and then your year group, which is year 10 and 11. And then if you find the poetry section, which looks like this, once you get there, you need to um, find the poems. And when you get there, you find all the poems, and you need checking my history, that's an abbreviation there. Um, and the poem is called Checking Out Me History by John Agard. And there's a couple of things I'd like you to look at at home, really. This isn't to look at in class, um, but this is interesting. This was on the news just the other day. Um, and it's about how black history is not taught in British classrooms, despite a significant number of black people in British classrooms, their history is very much excluded from the curriculum. And it's really quite sad. And actually, it's kind of the same elsewhere in the world where white empires have actually imposed themselves. That white curriculum is often left over so that even countries where people are predominantly black they can still have a curriculum, especially history curriculum, that teaches white history. And this is quite a strange thing. But that's to watch at home. Um, and what we're going to do this lesson is just cover um, quite quickly, I think, some of the context about the poet, about black history. And then hopefully we'll have some time to get into some language. OK, so um, if you you can do this at home as well, of course, but just so that we can go through it on this video so that you have it in class on my telly and on your telly where you're sat. Um, we have checking out the history literal presentation about the poet. Right. But I want you to be able to take notes. It's really important that you take notes of the bold text. You don't have to write everything down. There's a couple of little questions I've got for you to think about. There's some little quizzes, um, but you have to write down the bold text. And because we're dealing with context, I want you to do that where it says context. Or if you don't have this, then obviously make a separate subtitle on your paper. So let's just go through some of this stuff. Right. First of all, looking at um, these two flags here, the you know, all flags are emblems of countries and they all have certain things about them that are designed to imply and suggest something of that country. And so I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to think about what inferences you can make about these flags. Um, and I'm going to allow you to pause the video while you discuss it and then you can feed back to whoever stood in front of you some of the things that this might mean with these arrows, these colours perhaps, natural colours, um, the way that this British flag is stamped in the corner. Does I want you to think about what these flags could imply and we can pause your video now. Good, okay, so coming back. Um, these flags, they're quite interesting and hopefully you've come up with some good ideas of things that they imply. Um, this is the new flag for Guyana. This is the old flag for the same country, but then it was called British Guyana. Um, just to explain this a little bit, um, this is South America and there, right up in the top corner, you can see Guyana. Um, 
And this was a British colony. Like with so many places in the world, the British just sailed there and kind of had this attitude that this is ours now, we belong here, and whoever was here before, well, we kind of just uh, either enslave you or we exploit you some way because we have a better military and you must suffer at our hands. Maybe that's a little bit judgmental, but either way, um, Guyana became British Guyana um, in 1796. Here's a map of it close up, um, and it's called British Guyana and all of these old maps. The capital, Georgetown, named after the king at the time, King George. Um, well, it became independent from the United Kingdom in 1966. Now, you'll notice that this is in bold. So perhaps this is a good idea to write down. This is important that British Guiana, an old British colony since 1796, and then Guiana after independence from the United Kingdom in 1966. So you will pause this video probably now and you will write this in this little area here because it's bold text. So I'm going to give you time to pause that to get that down. Good. So coming back to the flags, what we noticed is the old flag of British Guiana before independence. So we have, obviously it's not Britain, so we can't have British flag taking up all of it. We'll just kind of create an area of blue, um, this area of almost nothingness. And we will stamp our authority in the top corner, the top left hand corner, the first place you look at when you read something. And we will also um, put the symbol of um, exploration and empire on it, a ship in a kind of coat of arms to show that this country is very featureless apart from the fact that it's British and that we explored and we found it. Not much there of Guyana. After independence, when they made their own flag and were given a chance to actually, you know, I guess, show to the world what they wanted to, um, rightly so, of course, they showed progressiveness with these arrows. They showed vibrancy with the colours. They, these, this green area showing, um, you know, uh, I guess a, a natural country and we have some vibrant red is a busy flag. And now it's a country that's going places, indicated with direction. This is really important. This is um, the difference between empire and independence on these flags. So here's the man, John Agard. He is the coolest man alive, probably. Um, the colonial history of Guyana is important for today's poem and the poet. You don't have to write that down. Um, but here's some brief information about the man himself, right? So the bold stuff you want to write down. He was born in Guyana in 1949. So quite a while ago, he's quite an old chap. Still alive. Um, he grew up in Georgetown, which is the capital of Guyana, and he went to school there. He did well. He was good, good at English, like you are. And he published two books while he lived there. Um, he moved to England the year Elvis Presley died, 1977. Um, so, you know, much of his childhood and early adulthood was spent in Georgetown. Then he moved here and he has lived here since. And he's publishing things like plays, he writes novels, um, he writes poetry, he even sings. Um, he's amazing. Um, and that is all that we need to say about him, the man. There is more to come, however, so you can pause this while you make sure you get this bit and this bit down. So just pausing it for you there. Good. Right, so now you've done that, um, I can just go back to... OneNote and I can click this, checking out my history context. A little bit about black history now. Some stuff that you will need to write down and understand to make sense of this poem. So checking out the history. This is about black history. This you're not going to be familiar with and that's the problem. So again the text in bold needs to be noted and still this is context right so you need to be writing it in here as i've said unless you're just using paper so the context is really important for this poem um, 
But again, we've got some interesting questions first, like we did with the flags before. Um, I want you guys to think about this. I want you to name the historical figure from these facts. Right, here are the facts. Who was born in 1805? She was a nurse. She went to help the wounded soldiers in the Crimean War. And also she visited battlefields helping injured men and she saved countless British lives. So I'm gonna let your teacher or whoever stood at the front of the room pause this and hopefully you can come back with some fantastic answers in a second. So pausing. Good, okay. Um, I expect most of you said the same name, which may well have been Florence Nightingale. And well done. You know, she was a nurse. She was around in the Crimean War and she did visit battlefields and she did help injured men. She did save countless British lives. But actually, this was another woman. This was Mary Seacole. By the BBC's documentary a few years ago, she was voted as the greatest black Briton. She did all that stuff. And many of you will never have heard of her. And if you weren't studying this poem, probably you might have gone through your whole life never having heard of Mary Seacole. But that doesn't make her any less important than Florence Nightingale. It's just that in this country and with our history curriculum, we tend to only learn about Florence Nightingale. So, another question. We don't have to write anything down yet, don't worry. Um, oh, just skipping past this bit because you know you needed to see that little picture of Florence Nightingale. We are in England. So, some questions. Um, where does your history come from? Whose version of history is this? Like, who decides what you learn? And, um, and are you being taught to exclude important figures? And um, I'm actually missing the bottom of this slide here. I think I need to press that. Uh, oh yeah, can you be taught a fair history that is inclusive of all figures? These are some interesting questions. We'll not do the pause thing here because I think probably you can see the thrust that actually there is a, somebody, I want you to just be aware that somebody designs what you learn. And that means excluding some things and including others. And you don't just take it like vegetables on a plate. You, people I think should be inquisitive and understand why they learn what they learn and what should be included and what isn't included. And what are the reasons for that? Well, anyway, um, some important missed history lessons. This is the note taking part, okay? Um, first figure, you're gonna look at several of these, right? The first black historical figure you've probably never heard of. Number one, Mary Seacole, right? You write this down. Black history figure I've never heard of. Number one, Mary Seacole. She was born in 1805. She went to the Crimean War um, to help wounded and dying soldiers. She visited battlefields helping injured men. She saved countless British lives. There's the blue plaque. There's somebody holding a beautiful portrait of her. And she came from Jamaica, in the Caribbean here. So she was a long way from home, but she still went to help those soldiers. If you need to pause this here to get that bold information down, then do that. Otherwise... I'm just going to move on. Um, so, black historical figure you've probably never heard of, number two. Toussaint Louverture, French sounding name, from Haiti, born into slavery, like so many black people were, in 1743. He was the son, actually, believe it or not, of an African prince captured by slave traders, and he led an uprising here in Haiti. And he was a military genius and his uprising led to the only slave, um, only country that was really begun by slaves in the world. Um, he defeated larger and better equipped armies, including um, the French, uh, which is, uh, you know, in Napoleonic times was one of the strongest military powers in all of history. And so this is a guy who knew what he was doing militarily. And, you know, he's a hero. Um, you know, leading a slave uprising isn't an easy thing, as Spartacus found out. So make sure you have got these written down these things in bold and I'll let you pause that if you need to. Good, moving on. So, 
Um, black historical figure you've probably never heard of, number three, Nanny Maroon, or sometimes called Nanny of the Maroons. Um, you can just see that tiny of the here, Nanny of the Maroons. The Maroons were known as the Windward people. Um, so she was born in the 1680s on Africa's Gold Coast. So you need to go a long way away from here, right down to here, to Africa's Gold Coast. She came to Jamaica, unusually actually, as a free woman. She led a group of escaped slaves, the Windward Maroon people. These are people that had escaped slavery, desperate, and she trained them in guerrilla warfare. And she, she actually withstood the British onslaught of the island. Um, and, you know, these were, the, like Napoleonic France, some of the strongest military powers in the world. Um, and she withstood it for, what, 25, 35, for, for like, you know, decades. It was amazing. Um, and she is on Jamaican banknotes. She's um, a mythical figure, almost. So, British history teaching is Eurocentric. This is a key word. You need to write this word down. You are going to use this word, Eurocentric. Definition of it. Eurocentric means focusing on European culture or history to the exclusion of a wider view of the world implicitly regarding European co culture as preeminent. Basically, if you're Eurocentric, you believe that European is better and elsewhere isn't great. Um, so I want you to write this down, the key word and its definition. Um, it's in bold, although pale, but you can see key word. And I'm going to let you pause it now while you write that down again in context or in other notes if you've run out of room. Good, well done. So that's um, that section finished. Let's just um, have a little look at the language of this poem. Well, actually, if we pause it now um, and stop here and then I can get a camera set up over the poem, we can have a look at it. <laughs> 